colleagues on the faculty, students, colleagues on the staff, uh, our alumni who are here, friends, and of course, my colleague Dean Smith and the Smith and Russell families. Uh, and we're very glad to have with us today. Welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to have you all of here and be able to preside over this, or at least to start this. I'm not really presiding over anything. That's going to be taken up by my colleagues. But I, it's, it's lovely to be able to start this wonderful event this afternoon. Um, we have this sort of happy, sad opportunity, uh, sad because the school will be in the summer losing someone who's meant a great deal to this institution, not just in her latest incarnation in the last four years, but also earlier on over a number of years. Uh, Jane Smith has meant a great deal to this institution and particularly to all the people, many of whom are gathered here today, whose lives she has touched uh, on so many occasions and in so many, so many different ways. Uh, we are able to celebrate her, uh, her time here, her times here, uh, and all that she has done with, I think, a wonderful event today. I can think of no way she would probably prefer to have her career here celebrated uh, than with a panel discussion, and specifically a panel discussion on Muslims, Christians, and interfaith dialogue, a title you may have noticed very close to the title of one of her own books. I think only a word varies uh, on that, and certainly a topic close to her heart and close to her working life uh, as a major scholar in this whole field over the last few decades. Uh, this has been at the center, I think, of her career in many ways, our topic today, uh, and I think it's therefore particularly fitting to have that uh, as, as the focus uh, for our tribute to Jane. Uh, which we as a school and the Center for the Study of World Religions, the other institution within and without the school, that sort of what Wilfred Smith used to call the tertium quid, uh, that sort of floats uh, here next to the center and has become really the cutting edge for us of many of the things that are going on in the school in the last decade uh, and under the leadership of Frank Clooney, who will be speaking to you in just a moment, um, has, I think, uh, carried on the tradition that began uh, over 50 years ago uh, with, uh, uh, with a, a new initiative here at Harvard uh, and at the Divinity School. Uh, those of us who have been associated with it and with the Divinity School know that the two in many ways are now indissolubly linked in a way that I think will go on for a long time. Let me thank, uh, while I'm here at the outset, because these things often get shuffled off to the end of every event, and I want to be sure that it's fact it's up front. I'd like to thank the planning committee who actually put today's program together. Uh, Jane's colleagues and friends, uh, Professor Susan Abraham here on my left, whom you'll hear from as moderator of the panel, Pat Byrne, our uh, executive dean, Karen Gruntler Whitaker, our assistant, our assistant academic dean, uh, Gina Lee, and Matthew Turner, also uh, associates in the dean's office and in academic affairs and Suzanne Rahm, who is the real person who really runs this institution, if you, if you didn't know that uh, already, and uh, with, without whom we couldn't survive. Uh, so it's great that all of you did so much work for this and have made this event possible, and I, I want to thank you now. Um, I'm going to say just a few words here in a moment, uh, but I, let me just tell you how we're going to proceed. Our Parkman professor, Frank Clooney, director of the center, as I said, will be speaking and then turn it over to Susan Abraham, who is associate director of the CSWR, as well as assistant professor of ministry studies here. She will introduce the panelists and moderate our discussion. After each panelist has spoken about their work and the topic today, the panelists will have responses, and then we'll open up for questions and, I hope, some answers uh, from the panelists. Um, when the panel discussion ends at 6, all of you are cordially invited to join us at the north end of the building here, down the hall as far as you can go in the Brown Room, where we're going to have a brief program, uh, as well as comestibles, uh, to celebrate Jane. Uh, and so that will be uh, from 6 to 7 in the Brown Room. We will try to end uh, promptly at 6 so that we can move to the food and drink. So uh, I welcome you all and hope you'll join us for that. Let me just say very, very briefly, because I, I will say something later in the reception, that um, 
Jane Smith has indeed meant uh, a tremendous amount to this institution and to all of us that have been associated with it at any time over the last uh, uh, four or five decades. Uh, Jane and I were actually graduate students here together. Uh, I got to know her better once I shifted, saw the light, and shifted from Sanskrit and Indian studies to Islamic and Arabic studies, which she had already been doing for some time. And uh, I've benefited uh, over many years uh, from Jane's work uh, and the paths that she has blazed in areas that I've not dared to go into. I think anyone willing to work on contemporary issues uh, on Islam, whether in America or anywhere in the world, is much braver than I am as a, as a, as a firm medieval. Evilist, I try not to get uh, into these areas, but I've admired certainly the work she has done over many, many years. But just a word about her, uh, about her work here. She uh, actually served as associate dean here, uh, uh, having uh, also been a professor here in the 1970s. She served from about 1980 to 1986 when George Rupp was dean. And as she pointed out to me just a few minutes ago, she left when George left, too. And I guess she and I are going to be leaving together, too. So, um, uh, But the nice thing is that I don't think any skeletons were left in the closet. Uh, at least we didn't know of any. And when I looked around and needed a fine scholar and someone with great administrative experience, and Jane had certainly had that with some 10 years uh, as uh, the, uh, what do they call it, Jane, the president or vice chancellor? What is it? They have a term. At ILIF. The dean. Okay, dean. And I know there was another title along with that. She at least was dean at ILIF Seminary in Colorado, uh, which I'm sure all of you know. You don't have to be Methodist to know about ILIF. Uh, so Jane was a seasoned person who was willing to come in, to come up from Hartford, where she had gone back to. That's where she had also done her original Bachelor of Divinity Studies, uh, and then uh, where she served as professor and director of the Duncan Black McDonald Center uh, there, and was willing to abandon that, although she hasn't abandoned her residence there, uh, but willing to come up uh, uh, part-time, which turned into be a bit more than part-time, I think a lot of the time, the last four years, uh, to really make a difference for us with our faculty and our students here as our academic dean. Uh, so I think that's enough said. One could go on with her long list of books. One could do the normal introduction. Maybe others will do that. I simply want to speak to her as a friend and longtime colleague and someone who has benefited immensely from so many things that you've done, Jane, and say thank you and celebrate with us this wonderful occasion. Thank you. I'm Frank Clooney. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of World Religions, and happy to add a word of welcome and a word of celebration on this happy day for our uh, panel and our ways of thanking Jane for her innumerable com uh, contributions to Harvard Divinity School. I just begin by saying we're happy to be a co-sponsor of it, partly due to the generosity of one of our donors, uh, Jonathan Aiken French, uh, Harvard College, 1961, who gave us a generous gift that we were able to use, according to his intentions, for something in Islamic Christian conversation. And this is a perfect event today, so I'm very grateful to Mr. French, who was unable to be here. But I was puttering around in the center library the last few days looking for signs of Jane. And it was glad that I could come up with some just to realize that this is by no means an ad hoc thing, but it's, as Bill was saying, deeply integral to the school. Uh, her dissertation from 1970 sits on our shelf. It was then published as the first in the series of Harvard Dissertations in Religion. Um, and uh, an historical and semantic study of the term Islam as seen in a sequence of Quranic commentaries. Um, she also has, we have a very venerable copy of this old um, manual, a reference handbook for teaching and research in comparative religion, a very useful uh, book from 1977. And one of the bulletins of the center from 1977 said, already out of print, hard to get. So it was, it was a very valuable work even at the beginning. Uh, Jane also gave, I noted, um, and it was kind of sponsored by the center, the 1977 Ingersoll Lecture on Immortality in Islam. And then her book in 1979 was the first in the center's series, Studies in World Religions, another first, The Precious Pearl, a translation of the Al-Dura Al-Fakira of Al-Ghazali in 1979. As Bill mentioned, Jane was six years the associate director of the center. 
But I, I particularly just like to add that, that Jane, in coming back in these past four years, has been a good and true friend of the center. Uh, not only, but partly by coming to our events, by supportive words, by reminding me when I became director last year of the values of the center, the values of the conversations, the value of the community that's formed at the center, and repeatedly being kind of a witness that from the, from the early years of the center until now, there is a value here that Jane in her work and her life in the dialogue has, has always exemplified. And I think just to finish, I think it's, it's a perfect way for Jane to make a final nearly final contribution to the school by saying that as I retire, to have this substantive, very fascinating conversation with so many wonderful panelists on Muslims, Christians, and interfaith dialogue. And I think it's just typical of Jane's heritage that she would want that to be the centerpiece uh, of an event, giving one more gift to the school. So I too am not going to have the honor of introducing our speakers. For that, I will turn to my colleague at the center, Susan Abraham, who is Associate Director of the Center and also Assistant Professor of Ministry Studies. Susan. Thank you, Professor Clooney and Dean Graham. Uh, I do remember when the planning committee first broached the idea of an event to Jane, she very sternly told us, do not make a big deal of this. <laughs> And I'm mostly obedient to Jane in particular. <laughs> so I didn't say anything, but the bubble, you know, outside my head said, it will be a big deal. <laughs> so in view of that big deal, it is my distinct honor to introduce a very spectacular panel and panelists to you. I will introduce all of them and they will speak in turn. We first will hear from Professor Ingrid Matson. Professor Madsen is director of the McDonald Center for the Study of Islam and Christian Muslim Relations and founder of the Islamic Chaplaincy Program at Hartford Seminary. She earned her PhD in Islamic Studies from the University of Chicago in 1999. Her research is fo focused on Islamic ethics and law, religious leadership, and the Quran. Her book, The Story of the Quran, its history and place in Muslim life has become a widely used textbook on the Islamic sacred text. She's also associate editor of the Muslim World Journal. Professor Madsen completed her second term as president of ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America in 2010, after serving two terms as vice president, having been the first woman to serve in either position. She's a senior fellow of the Royal Al Albayat Institute for Islamic Thought in Amman, Jordan. From 2009 to 2010, Professor Madsen was a member of the Interfaith Task Force of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. In 2008, she served on the Council of Global Leaders of the C100 of the World Economic Forum. From 2007 to 2008, she was a member of the leadership group of the U.S. Muslim Engagement. From 1987 to 1988, she lived in Pakistan, where she developed and implemented a midwife training program for Afghan refugee women. We welcome you, Professor Matson. Our next speaker will be Professor Amir Hussein, who is Professor of Theological Studies at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. His specialty is the study of contemporary Islam in North America. His academic degrees are all from the University of Toronto, where he received several awards, including the university's highest award for alumni service. He's editor of JAR, or the Journal of the American Academy of Religion, is on the editorial boards of four scholarly journals, including the Journal of Religion, Conflict and Peace, Contemporary Islam, Dynamics of Muslim Life, the Ethiopian Journal of Religious Studies and Comparative Islamic Studies. He is an active participant in the Canadian Society for the Study of Religion and the American Academy of Religion. In 2008, he was appointed a fellow of the LA Institute of the Humanities. Prior to his appointment at Loyola Marymount University, Professor Hussein taught at California State University, Northridge from 1997 to 2005. In 2001, he was selected for the Outstanding Faculty Award by the National Center on Deafness. For the academic year 2003 and 4, he was selected as the Jerome Richfield Memorial Scholar. 
In both 2008 and 2009, Professor Hussein was chosen by vote of LMU students as the Professor of the Year. He's editor for the third edition of World Religions, Western Traditions, a textbook published by Oxford University Press in 2010. Prior to that book, he wrote an introduction to Islam for North Americans entitled Oil and Water, Two Faiths, One God. Since 2005, Professor Hussein has written over 25 book chapters and scholarly articles about Islam and Muslims. Welcome, Professor Hussein. Our next speaker is Professor Daniel Madigan. Daniel Madigan is an Australian Jesuit priest who joined Georgetown's Department of Theology in 2008. He is Jeanette and Otto Reusch Family Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Studies. The author of the 2001, The Quran's Self-Image, Writing and Authority in Islam Scripture by Princeton University Press, he is also a senior fellow of the Al-Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding and of the Woodstock Theological Center at Georgetown, where he is directing a project on Christian theologies that are responsive to Islam. Professor Madigan is also honorary professorial fellow of the Australian Catholic University's Asia Pacific Center for Interreligious Dialogue. Before moving to Georgetown, he taught in Rome from 2000 to 2007, where he was the founder and director of the Institute for the Study of Religions and Cultures at the Pontifical Gregorian University from 2002 to 2007. His main fields of teaching and research are Quranic studies, interreligious dialogue, and particularly Muslim-Christian relations. He has also taught as a visiting professor at Columbia University, Ankara University, Boston College, and Central European University. Welcome, Professor Madigan. And finally, anchoring our panel is Professor Miroslav Wolf, who is Henry B. Wright Professor of Systematic Theology and the founding director of the Center for Faith and Culture at Yale Divinity School. His books include Allah, A Christian Response in 2011, Free of Charge, Giving and Forgiving in a Culture Stripped of Grace in 2006, which was the Archbishop of Canter uh, Canterbury's Lenten book for 2006, and Exclusion and Embrace, a Theological Exploration of Identity, Otherness, and Reconciliation in 1996, which was the winner of the 2002 Gray, Way Gray Waymeyer Award. And finally, After Our Likeness, the Church as the Image of the Trinity in 1998, winner of the Christianity Today Book Award. A member of the Episcopal Church in the USA and the Evangelical Church in Croatia, Professor Wolf has been involved in international and ecumenical dialogues. Example, with the Vatican's Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity and Interfaith Dialogues. He is an active participant in the Global Agenda Council on the Values of the World Economic Forum. A native of Croatia, he, le he regularly teaches and lectures in Central and Eastern Europe, Asia, and across North America. Professor Wolf, welcome to HDS. And thank you very much to all the panelists. Good afternoon. I'm speaking from up here because, as you know, this university has Protestant roots, so the chairs are very uncomfortable. <laughs> and, uh, but fortunately, I had a good Catholic sitting beside me who lent me his watch since I didn't know where mine went. And we'll, we'll, we'll see how this works out for me, Dan. Maybe I'll ask you in an act of charity to just leave it with me for, the, <laughs> for later. Um, you know, we each have 10 minutes, which is a very short amount of time, and I had prepared some some more academic remarks but what the heck, I'm here and I, I see Jane in front of me and so I feel moved to make them a little bit more personal. Um, when else am I going to have the time to, uh, let's use another good present term, testify, right, about um, my experiences with Jane. But really, uh, I'm putting my experience in the context of the subject I wanted to talk about, which is um, the increasing role of Muslims in American Muslims in Christian Muslim dialogue, um, especially in seminaries and, and uh, divinity schools. 
the theology departments in the United States. I was, um, my degree as a short form, I say Islamic studies, but my degree is actually in Near Eastern languages and civilizations at the University of Chicago. Um, for those of you who know the history of Islamic studies or teaching about Islam in this country, that means that uh, I studied in a department that didn't care very much about religion, uh, in fact. <laughs> Either religion as a phenomenon, religion as it's practiced, religion as a, you know, important aspect of human life. It's not something that area studies cares very much about. Now that didn't bother me because I was particularly interested in getting skills, gaining linguistic skills, skills in textual analysis, uh, historical analysis. And I had my, my own sources to find, you know, different methodological approaches to what I was looking at. And I had my own spiritual and religious life. But when I arrived at Hartford Seminary, um, I had to go through deprogramming de for about two years. Um, from that experience, the experience of a secular university with an area studies program where Islam was, you know, taught in this particular way, to a place like Hartford Seminary where um, where religion was taken seriously, religious faith, religious practice, religious belief was, was taken seriously, was considered not only an important aspect of human life to study, but uh, was not considered something um, that uh, should be destroyed you know, through the educational process. And um, it was all very new to me, and, and it was Jane Smith who really helped orient my way into this new world. She was director uh, of the McDonald Center at that time. And I came in with my area studies background and started to slowly relax um, after all those years at University of Chicago and realized that I didn't have to censor myself, um, not use a word like God in uh, public, you know, public conversation. Uh, that these things were, were per permitted. And the thing that um, really struck me was that although this was all new to me, it certainly wasn't new to Jane. She'd been working in this area for a long time, and I started to realize how much of a life, not only of, not only of scholarship, but a life of, and a sector of religious engagement in American academia had really been concealed in many ways from those of us uh, who were in programs like mine. Uh, why was that? You know, why was there that level of concealment? Um, and I think we could spend a long time looking at that. But I think when, when Muslims think about uh, Islamic studies in the United States, two words come to mind, either Orientalism or missions. Um, we identify Orientalism as the ideological tradition of the secular universities like those, uh, the University of Chicago where I was and, and those kind of area studies departments. And mission is the context that we identify um, as the setting for the study of Islam in seminaries uh, and theological schools. That means that Muslims come to these questions very often with a great deal of um, skepticism, caution, um, concern, uh, because in all of these cases, these are not uh, institutions that Muslims themselves have founded. They usually also have not had uh, much of a role in, in developing even the current academic programs. Um, and so coming into that situation, there is a great deal of caution. And this is why the issue of motivation comes into play, whether fairly or unfairly. Motivation or in Islamic, you know, lingo, intention, right? What are the intentions of the people who are studying Islam in these institutions? And whether that is fair or unfair, that that's a question in the background, um, I think it shows why the personalities who are involved in this study really make a difference. And why Jane Smith, 
I could see was able to get her students, her Muslim students, whether they were from the United States or Turkey or other places in the world, to relax quite quickly. Relax in the sense of feeling that they were now in a place where they could be themselves, where they weren't threatened, where they weren't in a hostile environment that was out to you know, destroy their faith. Um, and by having this posture or this ability to relax in this environment, this feeling of being in a, in a safe space, it meant that they were now able to open their minds as well. And uh, I never told you this, Jane, but I remember after I was, uh, I'd been teaching for a few years at the seminary. It was quite funny because, of course, I'd gone from this feeling of real anxiety and in this kind of hostile environment to getting quite relaxed at Hartford Seminary. In fact, it was quite good when I came in because we were in a state of administrative anarchy for the first three years. Um, so that's how we were able to kind of slip the Islamic chaplaincy program <laughs> in very quickly because there was pretty much no one, no one uh, uh, above us deciding that this may or may not be something that was very good for the seminary. So that was, that was terrific. And I had the support of my colleagues, Ibrahim Abu Rabia, may God have mercy on his soul, and, uh, and Jane, who were co-directors of the McDonald Center, to develop this program. But I remember um, I, ha I had, after being there for, for a little while, I had this very funny dream where Jane came up to me and she said, she said, she said, Ingrid, don't lose your critical edge. So it was this, <laughs> I figured, so I remember that until now. I said, okay, all right, so, uh, so and, and of course, Muslims, we believe that dreams are part prophecy. So I knew that I had to take this seriously. And, and I think it's that balance, the balance between someone who has uh, uh, sincerity and in their intention in really wanting to um, facilitate dialogue, who really wants to create understanding, um, who is interested herself in learning more um, and is, opening, is open to listening and incorporating those things um, into her scholarship with also the rigor of scholarship, which is, which is important because we can't advance in certainly in Christian Muslim relations without some rigor in what we're analyzing. One of the things that we see in terms of, and I'll, I'll finish up with this, it's quite interesting. I mean, obviously there have been some Muslims involved in Christian Muslim dialogue for a long time. People like Sayyid Hussein Nasser at a very deep level, um, Ismail al-Faruqi, uh, and here we have kind of two sides of contemporary Islamic Mm, thought, the perennialists, um, those who are focused more on, on spirituality, um, the universality of religions to some extent uh, in their particularity, and then those who, like Faruqi, at, especially at his time, was more interested in sort of politics and society and religion and, and politics. But the generation of Muslims who are coming into this area, Christian Muslim relations in particular right now, mostly come from a, an activist kind of background. They're the kids who were involved in community work and community outreach. They also have that academic orientation, but they're really focused on getting something done. You know, They want to solve problems. They want to... Um, engage with the other in a very positive way. They're not particularly interested in looking at, you know, sort of uh, uh, eternal the themes of spirituality and theology. There are those scholars, but I would say most of the Muslims in America and in, in other communities as well who come to places like Hartford Seminary and other institutions here are very interested in doing things. Now that's very good. And I remember, Jane, one time you said to me that we are one of your favorite verses of the Quran for interfaith dialogue is fastabakul khairat, so compete with each other in good works. Yet, we also have to, and if we're going to do those good works, we really need to take the time to study what the situation is, what it is now, what it has been historically, what are the barriers to that participation 
because no one goes ahead in this work a few steps without encountering a big ideological barrier that's put in your way by one or another um, members of, of various communities. So that ability to take to both encourage engagement, but also at the same time um, work very gently, lovingly, carefully, but honestly on analyzing the real problems is something that is so critical to the future of this dialogue and something that I, I learned from Jane Smith. So thank you, Jane. Good afternoon, and it's the Divinity School, so I can say Salaam Alaikum. Um, uh, my, my students tell me that I'm much less boring if I stand, and so uh, <laughs> we stand for just a, a few minutes. And it, it's an extraordinary privilege to be asked to, to come here and to be able to honor uh, Jane, especially for me, because I, I, I had the extraordinary privilege of being mentored by Wilfred Cantwell Smith. Uh, after Wilfred and Muriel retired from Harvard, they went back to their native city, Toronto which was a city that I grew up in. And so it was a real privilege for me to literally be across the street in the master's house. Uh, you know, I, I, I can say this because Wilfred's been gone long enough that I, I did circumambulate it seven times counterclockwise. <laughs> Do with that as you will. Um, and I, I can't remember actually if it was Wilfred that first uh, mentioned Jane's work to me or another of my uh, mentors, Jane McAuliffe. Uh, and it's really kind of funny to think that, you know, here I have Wilfred Smith and Jane McAuliffe, both of them introduced me to Jane Smith uh, in, in very different kinds of ways, that uh, Jane was the second reader of my dissertation and she was the one that really sort of shaped it because I originally wanted to write on Muslim Christian dialogue, meaning some of the earliest encounters, looking at you know when Islam comes into the world, who are the Christians that uh, they encounter, what what's the contact points, and Jane was you know what every dissertation advisor should be, just absolutely brutally honest, and said this is a great dissertation, except it'll take you a couple of years to your Arabic's not bad, but you have to work in Syriac, so it'll take you a couple of years to learn the Syriac. Then you have to go there and make nice with the monks because most of these things are in monasteries and the monks won't give them up without you know, personal connection. So you have to spend a couple of years making nice. Then you actually get the manuscript and you'll translate them. That'll take a couple of years. <laughs> then you can start to do your work. So this will add about seven years to your dissertation. You know, this is the uh, late 1980s, 88, 80, uh, 89, 90. Um, she said, or, you could do something on Islam in Canada, because there really isn't a lot on Islam in Canada. I'm like, oh, a dissertation that'll take seven less years. <laughs> I'll go with that one, you know? And so I, to this day, I quite literally, you know, thank Jane uh, every day, you know, for that. And, and, and it's fascinating to think that, you know, I, I look at my, my mentors and my committee, so it was Wilford, Presbyterian, United Church. Will Ox to be who supervised dissertation, Presbyterian. Uh, Jane McAuliffe, Catholic. Mike Marmora, um, Anglican, and so you, here you have this dissertation on Islam in America, Islam in Canada, and it's actually, I want to thank you, by the way, for inviting two Canadian Muslims, because who better to talk about Islam in America than Canadians, <laughs> uh, Ingrid and I. I don't mean to out uh, Ingrid, uh, you know, there, but <laughs> too late. Uh, what's that? And a, and a Croatian, exactly, exactly. Uh, but as, as uh, and an Australian, exactly. Well, but, I, but I love that, you know, on Patriot's Day, what better, you know? And let's say Dan and I see it in a little different way. Um, so, but, you know, and Ingrid uh, talked about this, so, so I won't, but, you know, what does that mean that here, here I am, you know, being mentored by, by four Christians, wonderful, wonderful scholars, but four Christians, you know, mentoring me about Islam, because of course there aren't a lot of Muslim academics at the time doing Islamic studies. Uh, they're at least not uh, in Canada. Um, and I said, I, I can't remember for life me if it was uh, Wilfred who first uh, mentioned Jane to me or Jane McAuliffe. I suspect it was Wilfred because I do know the first time that I met Jane was in uh, 1990 in Hartford Seminary at the conference that was organized in honor of uh, Willem Bielefeld's retirement. Wonderful, wonderful 
opportunity. As a young graduate student, I was first year PhD student at the time to engage with these really serious folks in very serious uh, conversations. Um, and so as I started to work on Muslims in Canada, it led me, of course, to the work of Jane Smith, and I'm glad to see Yvonne uh, here as well, Yvonne Haddad. Um, you know, we, we talk about collaborative work as if somehow new. The fact that Jane and Yvonne did some of the pioneering, groundbreaking work long before we talked about, you know, co-authored work, shared work. Um, I think the first book of Jane's that I read of Jane and Yvonne's was the 1993 book, uh, Mission to America, that talked about, you know, uh, sectarian uh, communities in the U.S. And it, it, it's a lesson out there to the grad students. You know, read the stuff carefully because you never know when you might need that. A couple of years ago, I was approached uh, by one of the top law firms in Los Angeles who was doing a pro bono case for a prisoner who had brought up a really interesting suit, and I can talk about it in the panel discussion if, if you want, but it had to do with him being, at one point, a member of the United Submissors International, Rashad Khalifa's group. And the only reason I knew about this was they were one of the groups that Yvonne and Jane talked about. And so there I am able to do this, this, this work. And you know, without getting into it, when a prisoner puts a suit forward that actually gets heard in the court, that's a big deal. You know, oftentimes those get uh, dismissed, but it was partly because of that book and that uh, uh, exposure, because I'd never heard of this group before. And so as a result of reading this book, I learned more about that community. Um, and then, of course, the 1994 uh, edited volume that they did, uh, Muslim Communities in North America. Just groundbreaking. I mean, we're, we're talking a good uh, decade before 9-11, and here they are doing really, really serious work on Islam in America. Or, or Jane's uh, 1999 book, Islam in America. I'd finished my PhD by that point, come to Cal State Northridge to start teaching, and that was one of the first books I used from an Islam course. Because you could do that. You could talk about Islam not out there, but here in the US and Canada. So using that uh, book really uh, as a textbook. You know, it wasn't until years later that I went back and read one of their first collaborations, the, the Islamic Understanding of Death and Resurrection. You know, I taught a, a course on uh, death and dying uh, when I was actually at Cal State Northridge. So I sort of read the books, so my apologies for reading the books out of order, but I, you know, I did get to that one. Uh, uh, eventually, you know, phenomenal, phenomenal work. Um, and so for me, it's really, talking about Jane in terms of the pioneering work that she's done you know, on Islam in America. I know uh, Dan will talk about interfaith dialogue, Muslim-Christian dialogue, so I don't want to uh, tread on that, but it was really interesting to think, I think, Jane, the last time I saw you would have been in Pittsburgh last year for the ATS, the Associated Theological Schools, uh, doing this really interesting thing about mission and, and hosting. You know, what does it mean to invite and host and be hospitable to non-Christian students in Christian uh, institutions? And it was a delight to, to be with Jane uh, there. And so I think there are many things to thank uh, Jane for. So let me just pick two. First, for her pioneering work on Islam and Muslims in America. And secondly, for her work that Dan will talk about on Muslim Christian dialogue, and, and also for helping Muslims, this Muslim in particular, to become part of that conversation. So as Ingrid said, it's not just simply, you know, Christians talking to other Christians about Muslims, it's Christians and Muslims talking with each other about Muslims. And so I just want to thank you, Jane, for all the work you've done. Thank you. I, I don't want to speak ill of Protestant chairs. Uh, and I'm boring whether I'm standing up or not, so. <laughs> I, th I, think, I think this afternoon is the first opportunity I've had to shake hands with the famous Professor Jane Smith. Uh, but our first encounter was uh, somewhat a virtual encounter because uh, as, uh, as a graduate student, soon to finish my dissertation, uh, I applied for the same job that she applied for at Hartford Seminary. Uh, and for some strange reason, she got it rather than, <laughs> rather than some ABD. <clears throat> but all is forgiven. Uh, towards the end of uh, 
Professor Smith's book on, uh, on Muslim-Christian dialogue, she, she takes a little quote from the other Smith who's already been spoken of and who is, uh, whose spirit no doubt hovers around uh, this part of Francis Avenue, Wilfred. Uh, and uh, Wilfred talks about we all talking together about us. Uh, and that sense of the first person plural, uh, which is, to my mind, in my experience, is so key to dialogue. I think it relates to something uh, Ingrid said about relaxing. Uh, the ability, as Wilfred would have uh, wanted us to do, to, to not objectify the other. We, it is not we studying it, Islam, but we gradually discover a certain we-ness uh, which goes beyond us and them. But in this day and age, uh, the whole question of, of our grammar of the first person plural is very complex because it has become more and more the case, I think, uh, particularly since September the 11th, the date that, uh, that nobody will ever forget. It has become more the case that, that people are defining we as being def over against them. Uh, those of you who play bridge and who, who very correctly put we and they, you'll forgive me if I'm mixing cases here. <laughs> but this, this notion of the first person plural, which defines itself, defines the first person plural as over against the other, uh, is one which is becoming, I'm afraid, more and more common in public discourse and more and more acceptable. Uh, there is another kind of uh, use of the first person plural, which again seems a little more positive, uh, but perhaps needs to be warned against as well. And that is the kind of we that does not distinguish. Well, we're all the same, aren't we? Uh, in fact, we're not all the same. There's nothing worse than when someone says, presumes that you, you belong to the same political persuasion as they do. And, you know, they nudge you and say, <laughs> you know, and, you know, what do you mean we? Uh, you know, I share nothing, nothing with you of your particular political views, though you might think for some reason, whether because of my religion or because of my uh, class or because of my nationality, that I do. So that, that sense of we, which, is, which does not distinguish uh, the otherness, it does not allow for any otherness, uh, can be as much a threat uh, as the kind of we which de determines itself as being over against the others. But there is a third grammar of the first person plural, I think, uh, which allows for otherness. It's the discovery that we can be part of the same we with people who are nonetheless distinctly different. And this, I think, uh, picks up another word that, that Ingrid used, and that is rigor. The idea that we are all the same and that there are, there are no substantial differences and I needn't really listen to you about who you are because you're just like me, uh, is, is the death of dialogue. The life of dialogue is, is a grammar of the first person plural which is able to say we to discover a we-ness with difference. So I don't have to define myself over against. I don't have to uh, do away with all difference or cover over all difference, but I can, and this is a much more difficult task, learn to live with difference and yet still uh, function within the first person plural. The, the weeness that, uh, that Wilfred Smith was talking about uh, in that article that Jane cited in, at the end of her book was against the objectification of the other. And he talked about uh, Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and atheists and so on. We all belong to the we. But I want to suggest uh, on this particular occasion uh, that there, there is a very particular uh, relationship between Muslims and Christians, which is not simply uh, identical or reducible to that style of relationship that Christians may have with other religious groups. 
there is something very particular about the Muslim Christian dialogue, which is not simply generic to all interreligious dialogues. In saying that, I, I think uh, what I'd like to do is, is really try and rehabilitate uh, the idea of heresy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nothing has collapsed. I th we, well, we, we probably all know that uh, early, early on in the history of Islam, uh, various Christian thinkers defined Islam as a heresy because they recognized that uh, the Muslim community was proposing a particular reading, not an orthodox reading, uh, of what had God had been doing through that, throughout God's dealings with humanity from creation through Adam and Eve, through Noah, through uh, Abraham, Moses, etc., right through up until the time of the prophet. It was a very particular reading of, of recognizable texts and recognizable figures and really of the same history. And so to call it a heresy is in some sense an affirmation. It's an affirmation of first person plurality, if you like. It's an affirmation that this particular religious vision uh, is part of our family history. And I think it's also fair to say, although the Quran does not use these words, that uh, the Quran would think of Christians as heretics. That is to say, in the Quran's understanding of things, if it's not being over, overly simple, there is only one religion that God has been revealing to us from the beginning through a series of prophets and calling us back to the original religion, which is the religion of submission to God calling us back to that uh, primordial covenant that we have all made in which we have recognized God as our Lord. And so Christianity is not considered a heresy. Christianity, as the Quran would read it, uh, is the same religion. Christians, uh, in their particular beliefs, their exaggerations about Jesus, their, their uh, questionable attitudes about Mary, their questionable attitudes about the role of their priests and their saints and so on. Uh, they're heretics. But again, I, I use that in a positive sense because it's a recognition that we are part of the same divine project and yet our reading of what God is doing and our response to what God is doing uh, does not fit with the, what, what is considered to be the orthodox reading of that. So our first person plural relationship, the we that is about Muslims and Christians, is uh, historically based on the notion of a mutual definition as heretics, which, uh, as I say, I, I'd like to rehabilitate that because I, I think uh, there's something positive about it. There's something positive in not placing the other in uh, a, an entirely separate religious box and saying this is an other, utterly other. The definition of heresy, the mutual definition of heresy, is a fundamental recognition that there are issues for us of importance to both of us uh, which need to be explored, which need to be discussed, which need to be struggled with because they are not simply issues of other wording, issues of other cosmologies. These are issues which uh, touch the heart of, of, of the faith of both of us. The question, of course, is can we do that calmly, with love, with respect? Can we relax with one another while doing this uh, without simply saying, well, we, we're relaxed because we don't care about it? Or can we say we are relaxed in doing it uh, because we do it with love. And so to come to my, th my third point, really, and so the two, two other things flow from the usness or the weeness, I, I want to argue for, for something which uh, I think, as Ig Ingrid rightly says, uh, is not always given very much attention these days, and that is to say uh, theological dialogue. Uh, it is true 
that the dialogue of action uh, and the commitment of people to work together for justice and for mutual understanding and so on is enormously important and is not to be, not to be dismissed at all. But my sense is that uh, we have a new moment of possibility. Uh, as, as Amir said, in his time, there were not many Muslims uh, involved in Islamic studies uh, in North America. Now, not only are there Muslims involved in Islamic studies, but there are also Muslims involved in Christian studies, and not only in North America, but in other places. So we have a new possibility, I think, for an engagement, uh, a real theological engagement, uh, which takes seriously the other's uh, reading, the other's other reading of the same history, and engages with these questions uh, as things that really matter, not things that can be simply put aside while we work on issues of justice and human rights, however important those may be. As a Christian theologian, although Sometimes I think I'm more an amateur as a theologian than, uh, than a professional. But uh, it seems to me that taking the Islamic critique, the Islamic reading of what Christians have been up to over the centuries, uh, is enormously valuable for Christian theology and productive to hear from people uh, what our language about Trinity, what our language about sin and salvation, what our language uh, about revelation suggests to honest listeners, to believing listeners, uh, is, a, is a wonderful challenge, a salutary challenge. And I think there is a possibility, uh, and the kind of work that Jane has done uh, in her publications and in her teaching over the years, uh, reminds us, I think, that we're talking about very large groups of believers, and to be able to come together uh, and struggle over these questions which are so important to both of us. The unity of God, God's saving of us, God's reaching out to us in revelation. Uh, there is nothing more important than that, I think, for us as theologians. So I, I leave you with those three thoughts. A first person plural uh, discourse which does not dismiss otherness nor gloss over it. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't get to the third. <laughs> yeah. Um, the second was theological, but the third, the third one, and I'm going to be very brief now. Too, too often in, in what we have been doing, uh, even in our, our finding of, uh, a first person plural discourse together, is. Uh, I, I go back to the 60s book, I'm OK, You're OK. You remember that? Plenty of people here are old enough to remember, I'm OK, You're OK. Uh, we, we have this discourse of uh, I'm OK, or we're OK, Christians are OK, they're not OK, the Muslims. Or on the Muslim side, the same thing, we're OK, the Christians are not OK. Uh, I think uh, one of the things we have to be able to, to move towards is to be able to say, none of us is actually OK. Uh, we have a dialogue of mutual repentance yet uh, to undertake seriously. And in our goodwill, very often, we, we gloss over uh, our mutual failings. We try to be defensive. Or we, because we're working in an Islamophobic environment, we, we, we uh, reduce things. Muslims, uh, when, when they're in minority situations, feel it's, it's difficult to, to acknowledge weakness. Christians, when they're in a minority situation, feel it's difficult. This will be the real test of the truth of our dialogue. I think when we can tell the truth about our histories to one another without fear uh, and admit that neither of us is OK, but with the grace of God, all will be. Thank you.
<laughs> You've noticed that all three of my predecessors have found it necessary to justify themselves standing here before you <laughs> rather than sitting. And the very simple reason for that is that we were instructed to sit <laughs> rather than, uh, rather than to, to stand. Uh, you know, so uh, after two very plausible explanation, uh, explanations of why they needed to stand, I was waiting for Dan uh, to come up uh, with one. I have absolutely none except that I'm following the herd. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm uh, delighted to be here, and uh, I, I had to follow the herd because I'm uh, the, the kind of odd person out here. Um, uh, all three of the speakers, previous speakers, are experts in Islam. Uh, I am not. Um, uh, Dan used the word kind of amateur. Uh, I was going to use the word dilettante because, <laughs> uh, but roughly with the same with the same effect. Uh, because I do feel that I'm kind of dabbling in Islam uh, in something though that for me as a Christian theologian is of extraordinary importance. And the person who pushed me to go in that direction was actually David Tracy as a young theologian. I spoke to him and uh, he saw my interest in dialogue, in Marxist Christian dialogue especially, which I was pursuing at that time. He said, you need a religion as another, one more relig one religion as a dialogue partner. Okay, and Islam is what you should do. So I dutifully, uh, dutifully followed uh, Tracy's advice. But really, my own interest goes back, um, in some sense, uh, prior to my ability to articulate it as anything like interest, to have any means of articulating anything, as a matter of fact. I was born in a fortress. I was born in a fortress that was built at the very beginning of 18th century. I was born in a fortress that Austro-Hungarians have uh, built in order to make sure that the Turks don't come near close to the gates of uh, Vienna. Um, and as a 10-year-old boy, uh, I played in another fortress uh, about 120 kilometers away, even bigger uh, than that one, built again for exactly the same uh, purpose with 10 kilometers of underground tunnels, which I absolutely enjoyed. Uh, and I thought uh, that, you know, the centuries of wars are nothing if they are to, uh, you know, they justify, they're justified if they're to provide me with a 10 kilometers of underground fortress and where I could play, right? <laughs> But, but you see also uh, there from, from where I come, former Yugoslavia, uh, that part of my interest is very much a political, uh, political one. Um, in the process of engaging Islam, of course, I've discovered other dimensions of Islam, deep spirituality in the tradition which was as important to me and is as important to me as the theology uh, uh, and the kind of political uh, issues that swirl around the relationship between Christianity and Islam. Now, people often uh, talk about 9-11 and its importance. I think that importance is only there because this kind of a tremor that we experience at 9-11 happened uh, at the heart of a major, uh, of the world power. But similar and even stronger tremors were happening all around the world. There were consequences of, of major tectonic shifts, if you want, in the worlds of religion that are associated with the processes of globalization. It's that that have motivated my interest in Christianity and Islam. We have resurgent religions in particular. Islam and Christianity are resurgent in the world today. 1.7 billion of Muslims, 2.2 billion of Christians and counting the fastest growing uh, religions. <clears throat> And it's not just that they're growing religions, they're also politically assertive uh, religions. And they're politically assertive religions, which at the same time, at the level of understanding of political theory, uh, broadly political philosophy, broadly construed, affirm democratic ideals. Right? That's also a result of globalization processes, which have brought these groupings uh, in a kind of shrunken world, in a sense, right? World that is interconnected, world that is highly interdependent, and world which doesn't leave many, quote unquote, religiously or in other ways, clean spaces. We live that intermixed people, uh, peoples uh, with strong sense of uh, our overarching perspectives of life and willingness to bring those to bear 
in, uh, in political settings. We live what I would uh, call under the same roof with many different uh, perspectives. And one of the great challenges that we are facing um, is how do we, Muslims and Christians as well as many others, how do we live uh, with strong identities that we have uh, in a common world and in a common world and under the same a roof. That's what motivated my interest in relationship between Islam and Christianity, and that's why I think that relationship between Islam and Christianity in the broader context of relationship with other religions, especially Judaism, is one of the defining issues of, uh, of, this, of this century. Um, immediately, my immediate interest was, uh, or, or, or my, my, I was kind of put into gear and started working on things after Benedict XVI has uh, given his famous Regensburg Address. Uh, less significant for me in that Regensburg Address was the introduction to it, where he made this extraordinary faux pas, right? Uh, reporting a Byzantine emperor's statement that anything that Muhammad brought into the world was only evil, right? Uh, that was actually the least problematic, uh, in a sense, <laughs> feature. Most offensive, but least problematic feature of that speech. I think that the heart of it lie a construction of Muslim and Christian accounts of God. Uh, Christian God is a God of reason, uh, and therefore uh, undergirds uh, and funds and legitimizes reasonable interchanges between people. Muslim God is a God of sheer will and therefore is the foundation of a totalitarian forms of religious, religious rule. Contrast between Christian God funding democratic, uh, deliberative democracy and Muslim God funding um, uh, totalitarian, uh, totalitarian rule that was at the heart of this, uh, at least for, when it comes to religion, relation between religions, that was at the heart of uh, Regensburg's address and Regensburg critique. And for me, that brought into focus the importance of the question of God. And here I go back to what Dan has mentioned, the importance of the theological dialogue and the importance of the question of God. I raised this issue for myself as a political issue, as an exercise in political theology. And my question uh, in the book that was mentioned, uh, Allah, Christian response, was a very sim simple one. Do Muslims and Christians believe, worship, have, the same God. There's a group of folks who, when I formulate uh, the question this way, say, so you would write 300 pages in order to <laughs> <laughs> answer uh, what seems to be an obvious answer to this question. Of course they do. And there is kind of equal number of folks who say exactly the same thing, 300 pages to write about something that's so obviously false <laughs> that we don't even need to want to open your book in order to read to find out what you think about it. Um, and in many ways, uh, especially the latter group, was the experience that I've had in many, in many circles, which to me, um, uh, many more conservative circles, which to me, uh, me underscores the importance of that, of that book. And the importance of the book is that in the, or the importance of the issue, let me put it this way, the importance of the issue, because in our fundamental convictions about God are enshrined our fundamental values. Can we live under the same roof, translates into question, do we have sufficiently overarching fundamental values uh, which can be the basis so we can negotiate our profound differences? And the differences between varieties of Christianities and varieties of Islam are profound and they need to be negotiated. Uh, they need to be negotiated peacefully. We can negotiate them only if there is a kind of bedrock of sufficiently overlapping values so that we can engage in dialogue rather than engage in uh, one or the other forms of violence. That was the issue how, that was how the issue was formulated itself to Nicholas of Cusa um, after the fall of Constantinople. It was a question, crusade or conversation? Right? And in many ways, this form of question has to be posed for us. Again, uh, will it be crusade, one form or the other, or conversation? And if it is going to be a conversation, 
what needs to be there as condition of possibility, both at the level of our convictions and also at the level of institutions for that conversation to be successful. Thank you very much.